Yeah, they would get a lot of companies would be really interested in that as well as an application pool. Yeah. Let's see how we're we doing. Oh, three thirty on the dot right now. Yep. <laughs> So I'm really excited to present today's speaker, uh, Jim McCann. He is a newly appointed faculty here at the Robotics Institute. And he did also his PhD here uh, with uh, Nancy Pollack. And then he moved to Boston to work in Adobe's creative, Creativity Lab. Before he then full-time the, uh, wrote video games. And then Disney Research here in Pittsburgh lured him into working for her, uh, uh, lured him into working for them, uh, but promising him to work on really interesting real, uh, uh, real problem, real robot problems. Um, and now he is a new leader of Carnegie Mellon's textile fabrication and machine knitting lab, and I think he will show us really cool work about his machine knitting today. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hey everyone, it's more people in the room than I thought would show up, so thank you all for showing up. I'm glad that you came for my four hour lecture on machine knitting. Oh, we only have, uh, we only have an hour? That's fine. Um, before I get into all of the details, I'm going to start sending some things around. These are only going to be relevant about 20 minutes from now, but I figure it'll take a while for people to pass them around. So I'm going to start all of these objects here. I want you to check them out and just send them in some sort of space filling curve that reaches everyone in the room. Uh, I'm sure you can self organize that. So what I wanted to talk about today uh, is on demand machine knitting for everyone. Uh, in other words, this is the how I am spending my startup package talk. This is what I hope to accomplish in the next couple of years with my first couple of students. Uh, it's what we are, it's actually a vision that we were working on at Disney before I came here and we're continuing here at Carnegie Mellon. But let's start with why I think machine knitting is cool. So this is a cotton safety work glove. It costs less than 70 cents to buy. But it's a really complicated shape. If you think about it, it has all of these different tubes of fabric. They all merge together seamlessly. The surface is non-developable. It's got places where it's not locally flat. <laughs> And not only that, this is a work glove that is made of composite materials. It's using cotton yarn, it's using elastic, it's using hot melt yarn together. And it has functional microstructures. So down here in the cuff, you have a rib structure which is able to draw in the fabric. Where here on the back of the glove, you have probably a, a standard jersey which is just a, a four-way stretch kind of fabric. And it has integrated state change materials. It has hot melt yarn here in the cuff to help bind off the yarns uh, at the end of the knitting. So knitting is clearly a process that allows you to do a lot of incredibly advanced cool fabrication techniques. And yet, again, this is a 70 cent item. And of course the reason that we can have a 70 cent item with all sorts of fancy techniques in it is that we have fabrication machines. We have robots that do the work of this knitting for us. And even more exciting, these are general purpose robots. So it's not the case that this machine can only make, um, let's see, only make left gloves. This is a machine that can make any sort of shape. So if we have these really crazy advanced fabrication machines that can make any sort of shape, why is it that you and I are not using them every day? Whenever I want a new sock, why am I going out and buying a sock of a specific size instead of uh, you know, one of just a few bins, instead of calling up my local knitting machine using my modem or whatever and transmitting data to it that says how to knit a sock? So I can get a sock that exactly fits my foot. I mean, maybe the reason is I don't care that much about socks. I mean, I wear sandals half the year. But maybe a better answer is that it actually is a software problem. Maybe it's weird for me to come to the RI seminar and say it's a software problem, but it's a software problem. Uh, this is the control data that you have to write to knit a glove on this knitting machine. It's a, a very idiosyncratic language. It's a graphical language where each pixel represents a needle operation. 
All of the needle operations are laid out in a palette. This is about a quarter of the palette you can see here. It's very, uh, very finicky, very detail oriented, and not something that you'd do on a lark. You know, not something I would do to get a sock, even a sock that fits marginally better than a size medium sock. So, if we want to enable on-demand machine knitting for everyone, we have to overcome this software problem. We also have to overcome a slightly larger problem. So if we zoom out, we see that this idiosyncratic glove patterning software, this idiosyncratic software that you use to write patterns for a Shima Seiki knitting machine is a different piece of idiosyncratic software than the one you use to write patterns for a Stoll knitting machine, which is a different piece of software than the one you use to write patterns for a Carl Mayer knitting machine. So we have a situation where if you want to do on-demand knitting, you have to figure out what type of machine you're knitting for, and then you have to learn a complicated, low-level programming language. I would like to take us to a world where instead of doing that, you can use a design tool appropriate to what you're interested in making. That design tool can talk to a common file format. That common file format can be interpreted not only by every knitting machine out there, but also by all of the cool knitting simulators we already have. But to get there, we need that file format, and then we need to really think about how to design knit objects at a high level. And that's the order I'm going to talk about them in this talk. The file format that we've proposed is called knitout. And to explain knitout, I really need to explain how machine knitting works. Knitout is a low-level, machine-independent description of machine knitting. First, knitting. Knitting is based on the idea that one loop, uh, that a loop held by other loops will not unravel. So check out this orange loop here. As long as the teal loop and the purple loop stay where they are, this orange loop will stay a loop. You can apply this idea uh, inductively to produce entire stable sheets of fabric from one yarn. I mean, take a moment to just think about how revolutionary an idea this was in the 1600s. People were making fabrics by taking lots and lots of yarns and stringing them up on frames, and taking more yarns and running them back and forth through those yarns to make woven cloth. And somebody realized you could take one yarn and make an entire cloth out of that. That's a really revolutionary idea. Also, 1600s for a fabrication technology is incredibly recent. I think that's something kind of cool to think about. So, if you're familiar with hand knitting on knitting needles, that's exactly the same sort of knitting that knitting machines do. Knitting machines just do it a little bit differently. So an industrial V-bed knitting machine, the kind of general purpose knitting machine that I'm talking about in this talk, the kind of knitting machine that's sitting in my lab over in Wien, uh, Wien Hall 1334. <clears throat> Though generally the door is locked and no one is there, but you know, if you ever want to drop by and you think I might actually be there, you can give it a shot. Uh, these knitting machines, well, let's just zoom in for a moment. They take in yarn, maybe multiple yarns, from cones sitting on the back of the machine. You can just see the tops of the yarns here. The yarn moves up through a tensioning device up here, and finally down into the machine uh, here on the right. And that's where all the exciting stuff happens, is down in the core of the machine. So here in the core of the machine, you have these things called needle beds. You have uh, basically these arrangements of hook-shaped needles. So the hook-shaped needles that are closest to us here are called the front bed, because they're in the front. And the ones uh, behind back here are called the back bed, because they're in the back. Each of these hook-shaped needles has two degrees of freedom. It can slide in and out of a slot in the bed. And there's this other piece of the needle called the slider, which can also slide in and out of the front of the bed, or of the bed. So working together, all of the degrees of freedom of the machine can take in yarn from the yarn carriers. This is, these are the things where the yarn actually comes into the machine. These things are parked over here in this illustration, but they move back and forth and feed in yarn. Taken together, these degrees of freedom can allow the machine to create pieces of knit cloth. And that may look like a somewhat complicated thing, but it's actually only doing one of four operations. So the four basic operations, and the only four operations that a knitting machine can do are as follows. They can tuck, knit, transfer, and split. So let's just go through them. Tuck takes a yarn, a direction, and a needle. 
and it adds a loop of yarn to that needle. Knit takes a yarn, a direction, and a needle, and it pulls a loop of yarn through all the loops of yarn already on the needle. Just do that again. Transfer, transfer is really the key operation because it's what gives you all of the cool shaping and flexibility that you have in a knitting machine. Transfer allows you to move a loop of yarn from a needle on one bed to a needle on the other bed. So if we transfer the, le or the rightmost two stitches here over to the other bed, transfer the rightmost two stitches over to the other bed, there we go. And then we move the other bed with respect, we move the back bed with respect to the front bed, an operation called racking, and transfer the stitches back to the front bed. Then what we end up doing is effectively narrowing the cloth locally. We had something that was five loops wide. Now once we're done with our transfers, we're going to have something that's only four loops wide. I should also say that an actual knitting machine runs a lot faster than this. <laughs> um, this is slowed down for illustration purposes and because this was just a quick hack and not something I'm going to spend a long time writing a simulation of. The final operation anyway, uh, so yeah, as I said, Four needles wide, not five needles wide. We've made a cloth narrower locally. Finally, split is an operation that combines knit and transfer. So remember, knit pulls a loop through an existing loop and drops the existing loop, and transfer picks up an existing loop and moves it. Split does those two things at once with the effect of, uh, well, let's just watch it happen here. So split, again, takes a yarn, a location, or a direction, a location to knit through, and a location to transfer the dropped loop too, if that makes sense. Let's just watch. So we see regular knitting happens, and then that, that loop that got knit through ends up getting transferred onto the back bed. Now if I move the yard care out of the way for a moment, check out what we can do now. We can now take that loop that got transferred to the back bed, and we can move it back to the front bed. And now, although it happened really fast, we have a piece of cloth that's five loops wide again. So we made our cloth locally wider using split. So just to drive that point home, using just these four operations, you can make all sorts of cool, complicated shapes. You can make, uh, by just knitting on some needles more than on others, you can make tubes that bend, like this sock. Or you can make this other tube that kind of bends and bulges with a sharper bend. You can make these bumps. You can narrow and widen to make things that narrow and widen. Uh, <laughs> and you can do things like combine all of those techniques and make a bunch of tubes and connect them together to make things like this robot figure. And so it is unsurprising, given that knitting machines all run these four basic operations that knit out would be based on those four basic operations. Now you might say to me, Jim, I only see three operations here. Yes. So we had a revelation between uh, when we were thinking about the basic things knitting machines do and when I was specifying knit out, and that revelation was that if you split with no yarn, that's just transferring. And in fact, there's nice, uh, nice sort of synonyms here. Uh, if you want to drop a loop from the needle bed, that's basically like knitting through it with no yarn. In fact, on Shima Seiki machines, dropping literally is you put the knit instruction in and you tell it to use no yarn. Uh, and if you, if you tuck with no yarn, that actually just pulls on a loop, which you might think does nothing, but it's super useful in certain situations when you want to make sure the machine has a really solid grip on a given loop. It can take a loop that's sort of weakly gripped and grip it better. Regardless to say it's actually an operation people care about, uh, which gives us this really nice set of three basic operations and three synonyms for the core of knit out. And then to make it into something you can actually run on a machine, we had to add a little bit more. So we add yarn handling operations. Those allow you to bring into 
action, bring yarn carriers into action and bring them out of action. We had machine setup instructions. These basically change the global configuration of the machine, like the current racking of the machine beds or the size of the loops that you're making. And I think we're going to need some more stuff here as we expand to more machines, but this is sufficient for the machines we have right now. We throw some metadata at the top of the file so you know the intent of the file. Uh, the, the contents of the file tell you everything you need to know about the topology of the stitches, what's through what, the structure, and where it's constructed on the machine. But it doesn't tell you anything about like what yarn you wanted to make it out of. That's what this header, header is for, that kind of metadata that is not crucial, but probably is nice to know if you're actually fabricating something. If you make, you know, if you, you make a pattern on a 15 needle per inch machine, and you make it on a seven needle per inch machine, one of them's gonna come out twice as large. It'd be good to know what the author intended. And finally, we have a specified extension mechanism because I don't think any file format of this sort is going to survive without the ability to extend it as new machine capabilities are introduced. And of course, as those capabilities become common, things can be moved from extensions into core language features. So just a small example of what knit out actually looks like in practice. This is, and when I say small example, this is about uh, a file about that wide and about that tall. It's less than an inch long and it's almost vanishingly small. Uh, if you knit this on our machine, it won't actually fall out of the machine, the one in my lab. You just have to wait for another knit job to push it out. You know, it's effectively dust. Uh, but what this file does is it starts out with a header saying what it's intended to be knit on. It brings in carrier five, brings in some yarn in carrier five, and then it does, just as we saw uh, before, it does some tucks to start out with. So it's putting a loop on every other needle going across, then putting a loop on every other needle coming back. So that's this block. Uh, and then it knits all the needles going across, all the needles going back, takes the yarn out. That's it, very simple, three rows of knitting, uh, knit out file. So you might say to me, if if a file that's you know, at least 10 feet tall only produces you know, two millimeters of knitting, don't you have a problem? Don't you have a file size problem? My answer is, you know, a snapshot of my dog takes two megabytes. Like, is, is a cool sweater for my dog that takes two megabytes really gonna be a problem? Probably not. Another way to, ask, to say this is we are, in the, we are in an era of language design where it is far more important for a language to be easy to parse, to be easy to write, and to be unambiguous than for that language to be compact. And knit out is, a, knit out is designed to be as easy as possible to actually translate into machine instructions because it is essentially machine instructions. All that our knit out backends do right now is they take those machine instructions and they draw one of these idiosyncratic color pictures which is further interpreted for use on the machine. Ah, that's actually an interesting question. I should say other folks should uh, not hesitate to interrupt with questions. Um, so the old fashioned way is that you draw on a napkin or a piece of paper, uh, kind of like a picture of a glove and you say glove and you maybe write some dimensions on it which are more advisory and then you hand it to a knit engineer. The knit engineer takes your design, looks at it and goes to a piece of software called knit paint. Knit paint is Think MS Paint. Uh, it looks it, like MS Paint, so yeah. That, that like, that. <laughs> and I, I don't say like MS Paint for knitting, but basically just think MS Paint. <laughs> um, so I guess the, the colors do have little pictures. If you zoom in far enough, each pixel gets a picture on it telling you what its color is doing, but most of the time you're just like, well, I'm drawing a pixel art and I know how that transfer, that maps to the machine. It's, it's kind of unintuitive. Um, I've looked at a lot of stuff in knit paint. I've manually fixed patterns in knit paint when there's been compiler bugs further upstream. Uh, and I can say from personal experience, it is really cumbersome to use. And I, and I say old fashioned, but that's, I'm assuming that's 20 years old, or 10 years old. How old is that? I think, yeah, we're looking sort of mid 90s. Uh, it feels, feels like mid 90s at least. <laughs> Um, before that, you would probably chart it out on graph paper, uh, and then knitting machines were at one point controlled by punch cards. 
so you would punch card it out. Uh, this is actually like, well, this is really a tangent, but like this language is very close to actually what's running the machine. It's very close to the machine control language. It's not exactly the machine control language. Some of these pixels actually expand into multiple machine control instructions, which is kind of interesting. Um, so it, there's effort there to make it nicer, uh, but it really breaks down, especially when you're doing a lot of shaping. It's really designed for flat patterns. Anyway, let's get back to uh, design tools now that I'm thinking about it. So we have knit out. We think it's a good back end, uh, or I think it's a good back end for design tools. We think it's a great thing to translate into, me, into knitting machine instructions. So an obvious question to ask is what sort of design tools do we need? And my answer to, the, to this question is always we need more design tools. I think there, is, there are very few realms where there is one, one size fits all design tool. I think design tools are as unique as the problems designers face. So what we've been doing in the textiles lab is building different design tools. The first thing we did with machine knitting, this is actually back at Disney, was developed this thing we called a compiler for 3D machine knitting. And the idea here is that I don't want to talk about individual stitches ever. I want to talk about high-level primitives for knitting. So the high-level primitives we use in this paper are sheets and tubes. And so here on the right is sort of my specification on the primitive. Here on the left is a bit of a cartoon of that primitive. So our sheets and tube primitives can be scaled, uh, or they can, be, they can change radius over their length. Uh, they can change height. And they can be bent using short row shaping in various directions. So that's a pretty flexible primitive. But that's not the entire story. The cool thing about these primitives is that we're specifying them in a space we call the bed view. So this is the idea that in the x-axis, we're going to show all the needles on the machine, all the places that can hold loops. And then on the y-axis, we're going to show construction time. So what this means is we ever see, if we ever see an overlap between two objects in our bed view, we know that's a problem. We know that's a resource conflict. What's happened is we have needles that at some specific instant in time need to be occupied by two different objects, and that's not going to work. When I say two different objects, I actually mean the edge of the object that's currently under construction. As you recall, we construct things by knitting along their edge, and they sort of extrude out of the bottom of the machine. Of course, you might say, Jim, if I'm just knitting a bunch of tubes, why don't I space them out, right? There's all that space. I just move them apart in time or, or in, uh, in space, and then there's never going to be any resource conflicts. And that's true. Uh, but a lot of times you want to not just knit a bunch of tubes, you want to connect those tubes together. And the way you connect tubes together is a thing we call gluing in the compiler paper. But basically, it's just when you finish knitting an object, don't drop the loops, the last loops you knit. Just leave those last loops hanging on needles. And then when you start knitting a new object, pick those loops up and knit through them. And that integrally connects the two objects together. So if I want to glue my primitives together, say I want to take this, this green object and glue this blue object to it, I need the blue object to end on the same needles that the green object starts. And I want to glue this pink object in, I want the pink object to end on the same needles that the green object starts. By the way, I think this is going to be all the rage at some point. It's sort of a half parachute pant, half skinny pant, uh, pair of dip pants. Uh, but we can't knit them with this resource conflict here. So we need an additional set of degrees of freedom for our primitives. So I already showed you degrees of freedom that change the shape of the primitive. Now I'm going to show you degrees of freedom that change the schedule of the primitive. The schedule of the primitive is where, is, the schedule of the primitive is where it is going to be knit. So, the most obvious one, and one we just explored above, is that you could take the primitive and move it on the bed. You could knit it at a different time, or you could knit it starting at different needles. But there's more. So you could also take this, and remember you're holding only a ring of the object as it's being knitted. The knitting machine is only holding a little bit of the object as it's being knitted. So that ring of the object that the knitting machine is holding, it could move that over on the bed over the course of its knitting. In other words, it could change where the object is being knit without changing the topology of the stitches, which is kind of cool. Further, because it's only holding a ring of the object, it could spin that ring around. And the idea of spinning that ring around is if you're gluing a couple of tubes together, you actually care about the relative orientation. 
Say you're making one of these robot figures, it has some knees, you want the knees to both face forward or both face out or whatever, you want to rotate those knee tubes so that they're pace, facing in the right direction before attaching them to the body of the robot that you're knitting. But these scheduling degrees of freedom lead us to a problem because now, well, actually let me, uh, Now we need a little abstraction before I talk about where this arrow is pointing. So ignoring this arrow just for a moment, we'll get to it. Uh, remember, we're talking about knitting on the, on the beds of a knitting machine, the, the front bed and the back beds. There's all this, these long rows of arrows. But that's really cumbersome to draw. So first, I'm going to take those needles. I'm going to separate them into two sets. I'm going to use this sort of darker set of needles, uh, far back and far front, as permanent holding locations, and the other needles, the lighter needles, I'll use as temporary locations. This is a common knitting practice known as half gauging. You use it in machine knitting because it's a little bit more flexible, as you'll see for a moment. Then I'm going to move our camera so we're looking down at the beds of the knitting machine. This is a practice uh, known as a bird's eye view. <laughs> and then I am going to draw boxes instead of these needles. This is a practice known as drawing boxes. Um, right. So now I can draw little circles for everywhere loops are held on the bed of the machine. And you can see as we scrub through the construction of this object where the circles are held change. This is a problem. The reason this is a problem is that when the machine constructs this slice at this location, and then it wants to construct the next slice at a different location, it needs to move the constructed loops around on the bed of the machine. So how does it do that? Well, Let's just set up the problem. Each stitch we know, each loop constructed, has a place it needs to go. And it's important that when, the, uh, when these stitches are moved around, we don't stress any connections between them too much. We don't want to break any yarns between these stitches. Remember, these stitches are at the edge of a long tube. So it's very important that we don't try to move them too far apart, because we're basically be tearing the tube that we're making. And nobody wants a pair of torn up socks to come off of their machine. Of course, before, this was never a problem because each of those stitches was programmed by hand, so no intelligence had to go into the planning uh, on the software side. The intelligence all came from the knitting engineer. What we did in this paper, and this is something that was really the core of the paper, is we realized that there is a complete heuristic for solving this transfer planning problem. The heuristic is as follows. You collapse all the stitches to one bed in a particular way, which decreases a particular uh, particular penalty function as much as possible. You then shift the stitches between beds, and you finally expand the stitches back to both beds. And this solves the problem if you repeat it enough. The proof, of course, says that you have to repeat this n times for n stitches. In practice, you have to repeat it like four times for any configuration. But this is the gap between proof and practice. Um, and with that transfer planning problem, in our pockets, or that transfer planning solution in our pockets, we were able to begin to design objects with high-level primitives for the first time ever in machine knitting. We designed all sorts of objects. Two I want to highlight are we did some garments. These are hand warmers. The cool thing about these is they're designed with these high-level primitives. So just like vector graphics, you can scale them up and scale them down. Uh, this is much different than if you're pixeling in individual pixels uh, in that original idiosyncratic knitting language because you really can't scale uh, at all in that sort of a setting. I also want to highlight that you can make objects with code. It's much easier to write a loop of code that says uh, make a tube, make it bend, make a tube, make it bend, make a tube, make it bend, than write a loop of code that says put stitch 10 on needle 43 and make it a right knit and put stitch 12 on needle 44. Uh, you know, it's, it's much easier to write simple code to do things like make the helix that form the body of the snake, or make this wonderful Hilbert curve object. This is the Hilbert curve stretched out down here. Uh, of course, actually putting stuffing in this Hilbert curve was a huge hassle. Uh, but it was well worth it. This is really just a fun thing. As I said, we make, made all sorts of things. I just want to highlight this. I don't think anyone has ever been confused, but we did not make this teddy bear. <laughs> we did make the hat the teddy bear is wearing and the sweater, and the scarf, but we did not make the teddy bear. We did make these robots, though, little stuffed robots. So that was 
our foray, our first foray, in fact, this predates knit out into designing for machine knitting. And it's firmly, I think, in the middle of what you might want in a design program. You still need to think somewhat about knitting in that you have to think about, okay, well, I, I'm gonna drop the end of this tube on, pick it up on that tube, and I have to de decompose what I'm making into tubes. But it's still much more abstract than thinking about exact single stitches. What we've been doing a little bit more recently, and I should say this is a warning, this is work in progress. This is not submitted stuff yet. Uh, is working on automatically knitting any mesh. So one thing you might, just, you might wanna do is be able to take an arbitrary .obj file, drag it to your uh, send to machine knit shortcut on your desktop and have it knit out of your printer, your machine knitting uh, device. Uh, and we can do that. So we start, uh, our system starts with an input mesh along with a time field. The time field basically tells uh, the system the order to knit the thing in. So it's, uh, this says start over here and finish up at the tips of the ears. You can specify this by hand, but honestly you take like the, uh, the first eigenvalue of the, or the first eigenvector of the Laplacian of the mesh, you get something pretty good. So you don't necessarily need to do that. The first thing our system does is it remeshes in a very particular way to make a mesh that obeys certain knitting constraints. And the way that it does that is by peeling the, uh, peeling the original mesh. So basically, uh, starts out at one edge of the mesh, or starts out with what it's already constructed, picks a thing that's one, uh, one unit away in terms of one stitch length away, seeds that with potential stitch locations, connects those stitch locations up, this takes care of increase-decrease shaping, and then deletes that portion of the mesh it accounted for and just iterates from there. Sometimes, depending on the alignment of the time field in a way I'm not gonna go into, it only picks part of that next course to actually retain and only trims part of the mesh. This results in that sort of short row or bend base shaping. This is kind of cool because it means that this system will use all of the shaping available to it on a knitting machine. So once we have a remeshed mesh, once we have the knit structure for our mesh, what the system does next is to trace that structure. So even though this knit structure obeyed a lot of properties, it isn't one continuous helix, which is what you want for knitting. What tracing does is it visits every node in that mesh twice, making it into one continuous helix per sort of high level tube of the object. So in this bunny, there's one helix that runs up the entire body of the bunny and up one ear, and a second helix that runs up the other ear. The way tracing works is actually quite straightforward. It's uh, a series of local rules based on the neighbors of the current stitch. So the, uh, the key thing here is that we set up that mesh very carefully, this uh, refined mesh very carefully so that tracing could succeed all the time. Of course, this traced, this traced graph of stitches, this is only a structure, right? This only tells us what we want to knit, it doesn't tell us where to knit it. So, the next thing our system has to do is figure out where to knit it. So and it's a little bit light here, but what it has to do is figure out where to put on the machine bed uh, each stitch. So every, uh, every gray diagonal line with cross hatches here is a depiction of the front and back beds of the machine during one construction step. Every filled circle is a stitch that's being made. Every arrow shows the motion of loops. Sometimes, as up here, you see that loops are parked but not knit on. Uh, this is could happen when you're doing short rowing because you're only knitting part of the sort of uh, part of the mesh. So again, without going into particularly much detail, this boils down to solving a upward planar embedding problem in a specific directed acyclic graph. Sort of actually, yeah, it is acyclic. Good. If it's cyclic, you almost certainly can't knit. There'd be no way to make it upward. Uh, anyway, so it results uh, in a upward planar embedding problem of a specific directed acyclic graph. Uh, which is an NP-hard problem, unfortunately, but the graphs you get are like five nodes for most things, so it's a very tractable NP-hard problem. Uh, once that graph embedding problem is solved, it comes down to just using the transfer planning heuristic from our previous work over and over and over and over again. So you get uh, a final position for every stitch, so this is just a small zoom of the entire schedule, it's right about here in the schedule. And this is a little bit light, but I'll just scroll down. This is like, this is the entire bunny here. 
So once that ha is in hand, we can knit the darn thing, finally. And this is exactly the bunny effect. This is exactly the bunny I'm passing around. Uh, we keep meaning to make more of them. We cast some more foam bunnies, but I haven't pressed the go button on the knitting machine yet. Uh, just to make this clear, what we made on the machine is the skin for the bunny. And we wanted to make sure it actually fit our input model. And so we, at great expense, uh, at least at great time expense, made ourselves some foam stand for bunnies of exactly the dimensions of the mesh we fed into the algorithm in the first place. And then we put the skin on them to make sure it did fit. And lo and behold, it fits pretty well, as you can see. So that's one end of design tools. That's the like, I don't want to learn anything about knitting, but I have a 3D model of a Yoda head. Please machine knit it for me. <laughs> that's a 3D printing in joke, by the way. I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with that. Um, right. So we also have a couple of other interesting projects going on. We've been looking at. So notice that that bunny is really boring surface texture wise, but knitting can make incredibly exciting surface textures. So we've been working, I've been working with some folks in HCI on collecting uh, machine knitting and measuring surface textures. So we've been finding surface textures in hand knitting books on websites and so on. We've been putting them into a format that allows us to easily machine knit samples of them. And then we've set up a simple measurement apparatus to get some data out of each of those samples. And we have about 300 so far that we can actually do this whole pipeline on. We have more that we've collected, but there are certain things that you cannot machine knit, uh, or at least don't translate super well. You want to do a different way than you hand knit. So these measurements can help, we think, uh, with things like building new designs. So if you have a database of measurements of how different patterns stretch, then if you're building a design and you say, I want a block of, of a particular pattern next to a block of another pattern, uh, and I want those blocks to be the same width. Having a database can tell you how much they'll stretch, so you can make sure that one is the, they're both the appropriate number of rows so they line up. We think having a database of knitting can help you remix existing patterns. So if you have a sweater pattern you're thinking about making, and it's got one kind of interesting cross-hatching on it, and you ask yourself, well, what else could I put there instead of an interesting cross-hatching? The database can tell you. The database can say, ah, these other patterns behave similarly, but maybe look different. And another application is we can estimate yarn usage. So you say, I'd like to knit this scarf, and the database can say, ah, I know those patterns, and I can tell you how much more or less yarn those generally take than, say, knitting that scarf out of a very plain, like, jersey uh, knit. This is also, I back up and say again, work in progress. So the final piece of work in progress here that I wanted to talk about is in simulation-assisted design. So simulating complicated, large, deeply shaped knit objects is pretty hard. There's been some great graphics papers on it, but it's definitely not real time. We're sort of minutes per frame for that kind of simulation. It turns out that even the simplest, so imagine you just had a grid of stitches, just a simple you know, 50 by 20 grid of stitches, whatever. Uh, but some of those stitches you knit on the back bed and some you knit on the front bed. Those very simple grids, and they're because they're so simple, they're very easy to simulate, or we hope very easy to simulate, can still do amazing things. So all of those wiggly pieces of fabric I passed around, those are all rectangles of stitches. Topologically, they're rectangles of stitches. But you pull them off the machine and immediately want to go into these crazy shapes. So we said, what it, could we build a predictive simulator for those crazy shapes you get with just knit pearl shaping? And I think the answer is we're going to get there eventually. Right now, we're at the point where we're seeing some suggestive behavior. You can see that this is beginning to deform similar to this output, but it's not quite as extreme yet. We have to figure out how to tune things, how to really get to the right, uh, the right settings for our simulator, and how to keep it going fast so that you can paint this interactively and see how it's going to deform. I think that they absolutely will. So uh, the two approaches we're considering right now, one would be, can we just infer them from intrinsic yarn properties? So you only have to prototype, like you only have to test a sample of yarn and then immediately fill in all of the other properties. So the simulations we're doing are using elements that are sort of larger than yarn level, just as a efficiency thing. And so that would be the ideal 
but it might also be the case that you have to knit a set of basis test objects, and then once you scan those basis test objects, those tell you how to tune everything else. I'm not sure which it'll be. Right. So I've run out of little boxes to zoom into us. So I think I just have to shift over and talk about where we're going with this over the next couple of years. So the first thing I want to highlight is that in both the high-level knitting and the automatic machine knitting projects, we saw this thing where we could come up with the structure we wanted to knit easily, and then the most of the work the design tool was doing was figuring out how to fit that on the knitting machine. So if we really want to see more clever design tools out there, we need a way to talk about structure without talking about schedule. And then we need the hard-hitting, uh, very fiddly optimization algorithms required to actually put schedules on those unscheduled files. So I have a new student, Jenny Lin, who's working on this problem. She started out with transfer planning, trying to expand our transfer planning heuristic and get to more situations, and might well move on from that to thinking about this bigger problem of how do we deal with arbitrary structures. One of the things this would immediately enable is you could take any hand knitting pattern and machine knit it, which is not something you can do right now because hand knitting patterns don't come with schedules. We also want to get knit out out into the wild. So uh, we had the uh, costume production students from the drama department over. We thought maybe they'd be interested in working with knit out. We might make some connections there. We're looking for people who have knitting machines and are OK with letting us just use their knitting machine for a little while so we can support whatever idiosyncratic input format it has. So far, we've had a little uptake on that. But some folks are like, yeah, come over to Germany. Uh, and we think, well, maybe we can find something closer. Um, we're always looking for just cool examples. I mean, I think one thing that would really sell the knit out file format is to be able to open an examples folder and say, oh, wow, that's neat, and that's neat, and that's neat, and I can see the source code to all of them. And that's where, of course, you come in, which is I'm, uh, I think we're already going to do this with the costume production folks, but we'll probably begin to run some knit out workshops on demand as people are interested. If you want to take up knitting in the most geeky way possible, um, you should get in touch. And we'll put together something. And we, I can probably teach you knit out in a couple of hours, and then you'll spend uh, the rest of your time writing wrappers for your favorite scripting language, because who wants to write knit out by hand? Nobody. It's designed to not be something you want to write by hand. And finally, of course, we have to think about new design tools. All the design tools I've talked about so far are not really novice-friendly design tools. They're just interesting parts of the space that we need to figure out. I think we need to really think about what a novice design tool for knitting looks like. Uh, maybe part of that is thinking about how you can remix existing patterns. So if I load a pattern for a shirt, can you build a tool that learn or that figures out what parts of that pattern it makes sense for somebody to easily adjust? And for that matter, we can knit something that is a skin-tight fit for uh, a bunny, which means we can probably knit something that's a skin-tight fit for a person, but you probably don't want clothes that are a skin-tight fit. So how do we make clothes that fit? Uh, I think that's just a a large philosophical, artistic, and technical question. So here's my contact info down here in the corner. Good, that's visible. Please feel free to get in touch. Uh, any questions? Questions. Far in the back. Yeah, so, um, how many people actually have uh, these like mini machines that can, uh, you know, I think there's like some parser for get out to the whatever like, G code kind of thing that the mini machine uses. Um, how many people use those? Do you see kind of like a three D printing kind of, um, I guess, growth um, of this tech? So uh, the short answer is absolutely yes. I think that growth is coming. There's already been one sort of home prosumer level knitting machine Kickstarter. Uh, it used to be that people had hand actuated knitting machines. This was a big thing in the late 80s, early 90s. But in terms of fully mechanical knitting machines, we're seeing a resurgence. Right now, though, akin to 3D printing, all of the really good stuff is at too high a level or too high a price point for most people to have in their home. And honestly, I think 
you could make the argument with machine knitting or 3D printing that it's much more efficient to have centralized places that have a lot of the machines than to have one in every garage. Um, so in terms of manufacturers for knit goods, there are a fair number of them out there. A lot of them are in China. Uh, fewer of them are in the US, but we're probably within 200 miles of a place that's got a big old uh, factory floor with a bunch of machines. There are a couple of apparel places that are starting to think about doing on-demand knitting where uh, in-store kind of on-demand knitting. Uh, Adidas has a big push to do on-demand fabrication of shoes. Uh, they also did an in-store uh, sweater knitting, uh, basically a demonstration that ran for a few months. There's a place in Boston whose name I'm forgetting who does in-store uh, jumper knitting as well. Um, and for that matter, I was actually involved with a thing that Disney did at the Alani Resort. So if you can search for Duffy and Sweater in Japanese, you will find uh, a fair number of examples of the results of that on-demand knitting exercise. Uh, if I buy a cotton glove for 70 cents on Amazon, is it made actually using one of those machines that you showed, or is it made using a more specialized machine? So. The answer is interesting and multifaceted. <laughs> if you buy a cotton glove on Amazon, it might actually be a cut and sew cotton glove. So what they'll have done is taken yardage of knit cloth and cut out two hand shapes and sewn them together gingerbread hand style. Okay. That's the cheapest you'll find. That'll be less than 70 cents. If you want one that's seamless, which means that it's not sewn together, it's actually all knit into a nice object. It probably was made on a special purpose glove machine. Gloves are basically the only thing for which special purpose machines exist. Uh, but that special purpose glove machine is still somewhat programmable. It's just relatively narrow. So like the machine I've been showing a picture of has about uh, 600 needles across. A glove machine will have like 50 needles across. So it might also have some specialized racking capabilities that the full size machine doesn't have, which allow it to do some specific, very nice glove things. Uh, but basically, uh, gloves, you're looking at something that's on a machine that's still using the general purpose hardware, but has condensed it down to the minimum subset of the general purpose hardware needed to make gloves. You can also totally knit gloves on these. And if you're paying a little bit more for a glove where it's made out of nicer material, it probably is made by a general purpose manufacturer using a nicer machine. Um, so these machines you know, got to their current form, I guess, evolving from the hand knitting process. Um, but what's, what's the future? Is that really the right uh, robotic knitting thing? Or should it, should it be different than this kind of front back, front back rack? So the thing that really impresses me with the current setup, this is kind of a sideways answer, but is that this is the only really, really repeatable mechanical manipulation of fabric of any sort that I, I know at all. And the way that it does it, like the way that it's doing it, the way that it has a needle to store every loop, uh, let's see. The brilliant thing is it's doing this end run around. It's really hard to take a piece of fabric and figure out where you are on it and manipulate it because it just holds onto the fabric as it's creating it. So it never actually has to manipulate fabric, it just has to manipulate the yarns that go into the fabric, which is a really cool end run. Like it's a great hack. Uh, and then in terms of the technology, I'm not entirely sure where to go. I think this idea of holding every stitch you make, it feels very inefficient. But the way that the manipulation of the needles is accomplished is actually incredibly efficient. The, me the needles are all totally passive. There's a system that slides across them that does all the manipulation, which means that even though there are you know, 600 needles, they're all basically little sheet metal parts. They're not cheap. They're seven bucks each, but they're not super expensive either. Like seven bucks is pretty good for something that has two degrees of freedom and moves with a lot of precision. So I think we're definitely in at least a local maxima of the design space. And I don't currently have an intuition for anything more I could want uh, in, this, uh, in this space. But I do think it's an interesting problem to contemplate, because it's certainly something where it's been more or less the same for 20 years. Have you talked to people who actually use these general purpose machines in industry? Are they interested in 
the software or taking next steps? So I've talked, surprisingly, most of the uptake we got was from shoe companies. So Nike and Adidas are both using knit uppers. And one of the things that they really are interested in are design programs that allow their designers to iterate more quickly. They think, because they feel like what they're doing is they have to keep, they have to keep innovating to stay ahead of fashion, to be uh, always cutting edge. And to keep innovating, they need designers that understand how to design knitting or they need knit engineers that understand how to do design. And they don't have either of those right now. They instead have a very cumbersome back and forth cycle. So I feel like that is something that people are excited about. In terms of just like using the knit out format, um, it's still very early, like kind of been slipping it to people who are doing knit startups and so on and saying, you really should look at this. Um, I'm a little bit pensive because I don't want to sort of like, I don't want to try to come out with something that says, yeah, this is definitely the format that does everything, because it's not. It's, it's the beginnings of a format that could do everything. How does, uh, how do the old style entries correspond to that? Is it approximately like one row with one block of data? I, uh, yeah. Uh, it is approximately one pixel equals one knit out instruction. So if you're writing it out, you generally put some carriage returns between passes, so yeah. Um, it's not one to one in the sense that what you, the way that the sort of pixel based languages have evolved is you have a sort of these colors that are macros for expansions into other colors, which turn out to actually be really annoying when you're trying to reason about exactly what the machine is gonna do. But uh, yeah, you have a pretty good, grasp there. So, yeah, so with the mesh, with the example of the 3D image or, you know, 3D block turned into a uh, printer like the Rapid or the Roblox, when you have something which is both which is closed except at the bottom where you put something in, how, is there anything in the knitting language that corresponds to how much stuff it would put in to restore it to the size it was in your 3D image? This is something we've really, like this question of, okay, how do you deal with the stuffing process in making a reproduction of a 3D mesh? Uh, this question is one that we've really thought about a lot and we don't have a great answer for. Um, it basically comes down to the fact that stuffing is lumpy. So somebody who grabs some, especially cheap stuffing out of a bag and puts it into your knit object is invariably gonna make your knit object look like a boring lump. Um, and it also comes down to the fact that knitting is stretchy. So you actually need some amount of simulation if you want to do a really good job of this. So we thought about both of these angles. We haven't really come to any good conclusions yet. I think the right thing to do is some combination of use yarn that doesn't stretch very much, like you can knit Kevlar, for instance, uh, and then stuff it until you literally physically cannot throw more stuffing into it, cannot cram more stuffing into it. So it's just at some like physical limit, which might be easier behavior to model. Alternatively, we need to come up with a notion of what it means to sort of stuff in general something. So simulate the process of like stuffing it and then throwing it into a washing machine or a, a dryer for a little while to tumble it around to see what comes out. Um, yeah, so I think that's basically the shape of what we're thinking about with stuffing. Mm. And I, I mean, you can always measure the volume of the mesh and put that much stuffing in. Uh, I think there's always going to be a little bit of a low pass filtering effect because that stretch will tend to smear details out, especially under the pressure of stuffing. Thank you all for coming and please do get in touch if you want to do some machine knitting. <laughs>